Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Woo! <laughs> Welcome to our Science on Screen presentation of Jane. We're sorry that we're running a little bit late, but we're about to get started. Um, the Enzian is committed to inspiring, educating, and connecting the community through film. And Jane and the Science on Screen program is one of the foundations of us being able to um, prove our mission to you. So the Science on Screen series has enhanced film and scientific literacy as, through this popular program, which launched by the Coolidge Corner Center Foundation in 2005. They're also in partnership with the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and its pioneering nationwide film series of Science on Screen, and it's expanded to 72 cinemas in the U.S. Throughout the academic year, Science on Screen creatively pairs with screenings of classic, cult, science fiction, and documentary films with lively presentations by notable experts in the world of science and technology. Each film is used as a jumping off point for the speaker to introduce a current point of research or technological advances in a matter that engages the popular culture and the audience as well. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna have Katie introduce our speaker and she'll do a brief presentation and then we'll lead into Jane and then afterwards we would love for you guys to stay engaged and participate in a Q&A afterwards. And we'll have a microphone up there and um, we'll give you a second or two to go to the bathroom after the film and then we can get started with this great Q&A. So here I have Katie, our events coordinator, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Mackenzie. So, um, just before I begin, I want to let you know that I have personally read our guest speaker's resume, and it is crazy amazing. Uh, she is so fabulous, guys. We have, we are so blessed to be with um, our guest speaker today. She's just so knowledgeable. Um, so, on to her introduction. She began her animal career as a docket at the Tulsa Zoo and there learned her love for animals was much more exciting than accounting. She decided to go back to school and earn her PhD in zoology from the Oklahoma State University. She has over 30 years of experience in zoo and conservation fields. She has worked at four zoos in the US and just recently retired as the animal operations director at Disney's Animal Kingdom, right in our backyard. While there, she also had the privilege to chair Disney, Conserv Disney Conservation Fund's Africa Committee for over 10 years. Sorry, it's a mouthful. <laughs> she has worked extensively in Uganda and the Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as with the Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance, whose sanctuaries span the equatorial Africa. In 2008, she became one of the founders of GRACE, the Guerrilla Rehabilitation and Conservation Education Center in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Grace works to rehabilitate orphan gorillas whose families have been killed by poachers with the goal of reintroducing them into the wild. Currently, she works as a conservation consultant with a focus in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. She has also been a very outspoken advocate for women in leadership roles. May we all give a big round of applause for Dr. Tammy Bettinger. I hope you said your last name right. You did. Um, and um, let's make sure this is on. And we have a chat too long. And is this on? Okay. So what I'm not good at is technology. So. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming out on a Saturday morning um, to hear about this. So this is not a picture of me. Um, uh, this is actually a silverback uh, male, mountain um, Grower's Gorilla, and we call them the unknown gorilla or the forgotten gorilla, and they're the largest species of gorilla in the world, um, and they're a subspecies of mountain gorilla, and everyone knows mountain gorillas through Diane Fossey's work. Um, but what I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about how I actually got my start in this field because Jane played a very big role in my life as I know she has in probably a lot of women's life. So let me make sure I hit the button that they, yeah, there's one they told me don't touch those buttons. So I'm sure I'll do it at some point. Um, so you know, um, as I said, Jane had a big influence on in my life. Jane and Jacques Cousteau when I was growing up. But I get seasick so Jacques Cousteau kind of had to take a back seat. Um, and I wound up working um, in the field of primatology. But I didn't start my life out there. 
And as she said in my introduction, I was actually a financial accountant. Um, and I became a docent at a zoo and really re realized that I liked working in the science field far more than in the financial field. Um, and so I went back to graduate school. And near the end of my time in graduate school, I had the honor of going to Gombe um, and doing some work there um, at Jane's site. And this is actually pictures of me. Um, people call this Tammy's hairstyles over the years. Um, this is a picture of me at Gombe. And you know, when you study chimpanzees, um, going to Gombe is kind of like going to Mecca, right? I mean, this is where it all started, when, where Jane started studying the chimps here. So I went there, and um, I'm sure it'll come out in the film, or if you've read In the Shadow of Man, you know there was a chimp named Frodo that Jane beat, beat Jane up all the time. And that's Frodo over there on the right. And every time he saw me, he stood his hair on end, trying to decide if he should beat me up as well. So the field, assist, field assistants here um, had to uh, kind of keep close to me because they said I look too much like Jane. And they made me take my ponytail out. Um, so because they said, you know, he likes to drag her up and down the mountains. <laughs> so, so I spent my whole time there in fear of not being grabbed by Frodo, but if he grabbed me, would I do the wrong thing and be a laughing stock among my colleagues for responding wrong when you get beat up by a chimp? Um, so it was great. It was great to go there. And this was near the end of my time in graduate school. And so I'd been studying chimps in captive environments um, for about five years at this point. So to then get to see them in the wild was really amazing. And I think that's one of the, the really cool things about my career is I've gotten to know primates in so many different environments. Um, and so while I was there, as we were finishing up um, our time, as things happen in Africa, nothing goes as planned. Part of the reason, one of the things we did when we were there, Jane had a field assistant named Halali. And by this time, he had been her field assistant for probably 20 or 25 years. And we had gotten an award for him through the International Primate Society, and so he wanted us to go to his home village um, to give him this award. So this is some of his children and wives, and we're in this village, and as you can see, it's pretty primitive. They live in mud houses, and um, there's lots of children, um, lots of people, and they all came out to help celebrate Halali's award. And um, while we were there, the car broke down, Took us forever to get back. We missed the train. We had to get across the country to catch our plane because we were on our way out by this point. And um, we wound up spending three days in um, a very remote village waiting for a different train to come. And while I was there, um, I had what I call my aha experience. So as I said, I was finishing up graduate school, spent all this time studying chimpanzee behavior and I had this realization that the only way that we're going to be able to conserve chimpanzees and other animals in the wild is by working with the people. So this was quite an experience after I just spent five years studying chimpanzee behavior. Now I had to figure out how to work with the people that live in the same habitat as the chimpanzee. And the, the real aha part of my experience was every day this woman would walk by with a baby. And I finally asked somebody about on the second day when I'd seen her go by three or four different times. And I said, where is that woman always going? And they said, to the clinic. And I, oh, oh, there's a clinic here? And it was mud huts. They said, yeah. So we went to the clinic, and it was an empty room with no medicine on the walls. The shelves were empty. And she was coming every day because her baby was sick. And she was hoping that somehow some medicine would get to the clinic. And so her baby had dysentery. Um, but they didn't have any electrolytes, they didn't have antibiotics, they had nothing. Yet we were there talking to people about conserving chimpanzees. And that was my aha moment when I said, how can we ask her to save chimpanzees if she can't save her baby, right? So luckily, being the good American travelers we are, we had tons of antibiotics, electrolytes, you know, Pepto-Bismol, you name it, you know, we carried it, Imodium. We dug it out of our suitcases because we knew we were near... Um, time to go home. We took it, gave it all to the clinic, um, and they were able to help her treat her baby. And that's when I realized that, for me, 
I realized I had to learn to work with the people. And so I spent the rest of my career, that probably the next 25 years, um, working with the people that live adjacent to primate habitats. Um, so now I want to talk to you a little bit about what that looks like. Um, so, you know, okay, so this is your science lesson. They told me I had to give a science lesson. Um, so uh, when you are really looking at doing conservation in the field, you have to look at understanding the local culture. And that, doesn't, that includes if we're talking about sea turtles here on the beaches in Florida, we need to understand the people that live near the sea turtles, right? When we go into another country, we need to understand the people there. We need to understand their situation and what's important to them. And we have to involve them in the solution. Um, we can't come in as outsiders and say, you need to do X, right? Um, we need to understand their situation and involve them in what it's going to take to conserve the area. Um, capacity in a lot of these countries is very low. Um, Democratic Republic of Congo, that's the one you see on the news with the UN and the machine guns and, and displaced person camps and um, um, the area we work in. When we started working there, it was known as the rape capital of the world. So, you know, these are people that live in very hard conditions. So to work with them on conservation issues, um, we really have to b build their capacity so they can run the programs. We have to identify economic alternatives to them. And we have to educate, 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 and then evaluate what we're doing. And so I think really for me, my um, financial background has helped a lot with economic alternatives and helping them learn to, to budget programs. Um, and then my science side has really helped me in evaluating these programs because um, we usually have to do things. I always say we try it three times before we start getting it right. Um, so you have, to, you have to try something, evaluate it, and, and see how it's going to work. And that's kind of what we did. And this is our staff at the gorilla facility in the Congo. Um, and um, I'm the one in the middle. Um, and this was when I was there last November. And um, our facility now is run 100% by Congolese at this point. Just a few months ago, we were able to transition to that. All, even our leadership there is Congolese. And this facility is run. And that's really important in a country that's very politically um, unstable. Um, right now, there's a lot of political unrest there, a lot of rebel activity in the area. So it's not safe for us to go in. Um, and that's where we really have to depend on our Congolese staff to be able to care for these gorillas, work with the communities, work with the government, and protect the area. Um, so we're really proud of what we've accomplished. Um, as I said, when you work in northeastern DRC, there's a lot of challenges. So Uganda was great. First, they speak English, which is always nice. Speak French in the DRC. If you're a budding scientist, learn French. If you want to work in Africa, learn Spanish. If you want to work in Latin America, never worked in Asia. I'm not sure what you learned to speak there, but um, you're going to need another language. Um, understand the political situation and understand you're not in America anymore. Okay? So your constitutional rights don't apply. Um, so figure out how to work in these places. So you really need um, a background in political science. Um, Learn how to work in an area that's extremely impoverished. And learn the difference between, I will tell you, the people that we work with, especially now that we have the facility there, they think they're rich. So, um, you know, it, what may look like poverty to us isn't necessarily poverty to them. So developing a comfort le level and working in that environment and doing what you can to bring the standard up. Um, we, we have no infrastructure there. So we never thought when we built Grace there that we were going to have to build the road, update the electrical system, bring in water. I mean, every single thing. You don't just build the road. We fix the road. Every year we have a budget for fixing the road because it's mud and it washes out. So um, as we were building a facility that would hold uh, these gorillas, adult male Grower's gorillas can weigh up to 500 pounds. Um, as we're building that facility, they live in mud huts. So we had to teach them how to build a facility that's going to contain a 500-pound gorilla. Um, everything is done by hand. 
Um, the sand is brought in, the water is brought in, everything is done by hand. It's at about, um, it's about 6,000 feet elevation, I think, and so there is no air up there, I'm just gonna tell you right now. And when you come from Florida at zero, going up to 6,000 feet, it's tough. And everything's uphill and muddy. Um, so this is um, making the bricks that we're gonna use to build the facility. Um, this is a lady, if you look right here, she's got a baby tied onto the front. This is her daughter here, and they're hauling wood. Um, for probably for fires or perhaps to sell um, to, to earn a little bit of money. Um, they, they carry things suspended from their heads. No shoes here. She's got on some flip-flops. How she keeps them on in the mud and the hills is beyond me. Um, but this is very common. This is on the road going to, to the place where we used to stay. Um, lots of military. You get very used to seeing people with big guns and missile launchers walking around, whether it's the UN, the Congolese military, rebel groups, we got them all. Um, and so, uh, developing a comfort level with that. And then you always have all these little children everywhere you go, we call them the local children, um, and they're with you all the time as well. And they're just very curious about what you're doing. And um, in spite of all of these horrible things I just told you, I have to tell you I've never met more amazing people in my life. I really resisted working on the Congo for a long time because I didn't speak very good French. Um, and you know, I'd heard all the stories and I was, I was terrified. But the first time I went there, you know, I went there because love gorillas, love chimpanzees. They have incredible biodiversity. They have a copy found nowhere else except in the DRC. The Grower's Gorilla is nowhere else except the DRC. This is a landscape from um, the sanctuary where we work. It's just, you, you know, you walk in the clouds. How beautiful is this? But you may go because you love the people, but you're gonna reach, you go because you love the animals, you're gonna return because you love the people. And it has the most amazing people you'll ever meet in your life. In spite of all of these hardships, they laugh, they show up for work, they will, they, they will volunteer their time to help us. And um, they really care about their wildlife and they care about their future. You know, they don't wanna live in an unstable political environment. They don't want their children to not have an education. So they, they want a better life and they will work hard to get it. And, and they're just an incredible people and so that's why um, what, coming up on 10 years later, I'm still going back to Congo. Um, and even in my retirement, most of my time now is spent on working with projects in the DRC. So I want you to not take my word for it. I'm gonna play a little video for you, okay? And I want you to meet some of our staff at, um, at Grace um, and see the environment. And it's a, it's a three minute video and um, it has our traditional king from the region, talks about what this facility meant. And I want you to understand, they came to us and asked us if we would help them do this. We didn't go and say, you need to do this. They came to us and said, we need to do this. Um, can you help us? And that's how um, I got involved when I was working at Disney, and Disney has been a major supporter of this project um, over the last 10 years. So I think this should play. Grouse gorillas are the largest primates in the world, and nobody knows about them. It's a species that is endemic to the eastern DRC, and they're endangered. We estimate population between 2,000 and 5,000 individuals, and we are trying to rehabilitate orphan gorillas that have been confiscated. 
when a gorilla arrives here, they have gone through the most horrible things. There's a lot of instability in the area, which has caused habitat destruction and even the illegal trade in baby gorillas. They needed a long-term solution, and that's why Grace was created. A long-term solution where Grouse gorillas could be rehabilitated, integrated in a family group, and hopefully one day they can be reintroduced into the wild. They live together in a natural forest habitat. Nous on prend les jeunes à disponibilité derrière la maman. Sa maman est petite. Pour la maman, il est resté sur un niveau. Chaque gorille est unique et a sa personnalité. Il faut vous concentrer à protéger ces gorilles. C'est ça que nous voulons plus que les enfants prennent. Les enfants doivent pouvoir grandir avec cette idée de conserver. Parce qu'elle vit à part de la communauté. La communauté est importante pour nous ici. Nous sommes interdépendants. Nous portons même fort, nous s'entraînons pour conserver notre belle nature. Pas seulement pour les animaux, mais aussi pour nous. What do I want to do? Il faut que this is a community initiative and we are basically doing this together. The communities in the Eastern DRC, they are the real future for Browns and Reds. Thank you for us, we are really a house, we are going to learn a lot about our children. Les enfants et les enfants des de amis et tout le monde peuvent avoir l'occasion de voir le gouvernement. I think one of the things that I've learned from Jane was not only um, that women could do something outside of the box, um, and my love for, I'm a chimpanzee person that got stuck with gorillas, um, but um, you know, learning that it takes more than studying the animals. So you know, Jane is the UN ambassador for peace, um, she has much passion around a program called Roots and Shoots that works with children um, to teach them about conservation so that they are the future um, of our environment. And so from her, um, we learned that, you know, it's one thing to love the animals, but you have to love them enough to do something to help them survive. And that's, that's working with the people to empower them to do that. So um, I think, as you saw from the little film, that those gorillas are survivors. Every one of them's family were killed by poachers. They were, uh, one of them came in and that had been stuffed in a bag, a backpack. We had another one that had been stuffed in a burlap bag for weeks. Um, and so these babies are survivors. And you saw them now. Some of them are teenagers. Um, and they live together in a social group. And those older females, when we get new babies in now, we don't raise them. As soon as they're through quarantine, we give them to those adult female gorillas. They take them and they're their moms. And these are the ones that we hope to reintroduce into the wild. So as we go and watch the movie about Jane, I think that I hope she impacts your life like she has mine. And you know, I hope you have the um, opportunity to work with a project and learn about a project and I encourage you to learn about Grace because it is truly amazing field to work in. And we have a nice table out front and we'll have a Q&A at the end. And with that, I think we're ready to start the movie. Um, we can go ahead and start um, first. Did everyone enjoy that amazing footage? And
You know, a common question I get from my Congolese female, the, the women in Congo that I work with, is they're very inspired by the fact that I often bring other women with me. And they're very inspired by the fact that women, if we can travel halfway across the world to um, come to Congo, then what must they be able to do? So I think it's um, um, in addition to the amazing information Jane learned about Chimps, her role model on um, what can be accomplished if you just uh, don't believe what they tell you and keep going. So um, uh, they told me to go ahead and open it up for questions. They have a microphone over there. Um, if the first brave soul wants to um, go over there. And if there's not a, do we have, oh, I thought I saw a brave I'll soul. I'll start you off. Thank you. <laughs> uh, did you notice uh, that gorillas have the same sort of depression as chimpanzees? Um, they do. So one of the things, as you can imagine, when we get these baby, chim um, baby gorillas in um, to grace is that they have gone through quite a traumatic event. And chimps are pretty tough and pretty resilient. Um, whereas gorillas tend to give up pretty easily. So one of the things that we have to do is really not allow them to do that. So when they first come in, we often strap them to one of their Congolese caregivers, and we never let them put that baby down. And we force them to eat, we force them to stay hydrated. Um, we're working with our veterinarians remotely, um, nonstop, and we really have to work hard um, to get them to not give up. Um, we start trying to, as quickly as we can ascertain their disease status, get them seeing other gorillas, because that's very in inspirational for them. And as I said, one of the things we do is get them on a gorilla as quickly as we can. And that really seems to help them get through that um, traumatic period. But we have lost a few. And um, we've come close with a few because of this, this depression that they will go in. But one of the other things in watching this, um, this film that I remembered is, you know, as I said, I, I was a chimp person, right? And chimps, um, they cannot keep a secret. Um, and once you learn chimp behavior and chimp communication, you know exactly what they are thinking at all times. Gorillas, on the other hand, are very stoic. And to this day, I can still never figure out what a gorilla is thinking. And some of the ladies here in the gray shirts that say Grower's Gorillas, um, and they're part of the, the Disney team that works with the gorillas, and they um, have come to Congo as well. And they'll always go, can't you see, look at his face. And it's like, it looks the same as every other face. So one of the big differences in chimps and gorillas is gorillas are much more stoic in general. But of course, that can work against you when they're sick, right? Because you don't know they're sick until they're really sick, because they're very stoic. Dr. Bettinger, I understand what drives the poaching of other animals like rhinoceros and, and um, elephants for the ivory. What drives the poaching of gorillas? So a baby gorilla on the black market can sell for about $25,000. Um, so you can imagine um, if you're a community that maybe makes, you're a family that makes less than a dollar a day, even the thought uh, that kind of money is a pretty high incentive, right? So um, really what drives it is um, the demand. Um, I will say that I think, I feel like early on in Grace, we were getting in gorillas much quickly than we are now. Now we're down to probably less than one a year. That's the number that makes it alive. As I said, gorillas are pretty fragile and um, so we know a lot of them die before we even hear of a poaching event. Um, but um, the numbers has dropped drastically because we've really done a great job of closing off a lot of the markets. So right now, the only place they're probably really going is some of the Asian markets, where there's, they'll still occasionally, uh, we'll find out about an, an importation of a gorilla over there. Um, but it, it's, it's, the, it's, it's money. And unfortunately, poaching, chimps are in a much worse condition. As I said, um, we work closely with the Jane Goodall Institute in Congo. And um, there's a couple sanctuaries in Congo that take in chimps. And there are literally 
um, so many chimps in need of help over there. Um, and the sanctuaries are, are, are whereas we have 14 gorillas at Grace, the chimp sanctuaries can have, you know, upwards of 100 chimps. So um, it's, it's a much harder situation because chimps are pretty, pretty, they're, they're tough, man. They are tough. Um, and that's good and bad, right? The bad news is they can live in horrid conditions. And um, it's pretty heart-wrenching. And again, it's that illegal trade. People get them, they think they're adorable, they see those cute babies, and they are adorable as cute babies, but you know they grow up to be five times stronger than a human, and a chimp, not a human. So um, it, it's just, it's a tough situation for, for chimps as well as gorillas. For gorillas, I can say I think it's getting a little bit better, but for chimps, we still have a lot of work to do. Hey, how are you? Um, I actually had one question, and then I have a I guess a secondary one on the depression issue, which I'll ask first, and that is if you see long-term effects in your gorillas for those who have suffered, like you said earlier, a baby came in in a sack for a week, if you see such things as we may see in humans as PTSD or long-term behavioral issues, that sort of thing. Um, my original question was regarding the tools. Um, I'm assuming that they would have or do have some sort of tools that they would use, have you seen evolution over the time of the use of those tools? Are they pretty consistent in what they're using them for and what they do? Um, so um, I'll start with the tool use question first. It's a little easier. Um, chimps use, um, we found in the, on the west coast of Africa, they'll use stones to break nuts. So they'll use them like hammers. Um, and then the tool use for the fishing tools, modifying that. Um, you know, one of the things we see in captive chimps is that they're very good at mimicking. And Jane also found this when they set up that feeding station. They pretty quickly figured out that they could watch the humans and see how they worked things like doorknobs and latches. Um, and so they're very good at imitating behaviors. So their tool use has expanded out. I mean, the chimps I've worked with in captivity can use keys, okay? So they can unlock doors. I mean, they, they see humans doing things and, and they can pretty quickly do that. In the wild, mostly we see things like the modification of sticks, the use of stones for breaking nuts, um, and those type of behaviors. So, so the tool use, it kind of has expanded out, but it's because of their, even in the wild, living in closer proximity to humans and um, mimicking human behavior. Um, then the, your question on depression, I feel like, and, and I think Rachel is out um, front, but, but um, Mary, she's a, a gorilla keeper at Disney and she's followed Grace very closely. I feel like once we can get those gorillas onto um, a gorilla mom and into that big social group, they pretty quickly become gorillas. So I've worked with chimps in sanctuaries in Africa a lot too, and what I see is chimps kind of, they can walk that world between um, the human caregiver and the chimp caregiver uh, much better. The gorillas, what we find is once we give them a gorilla mom, they're kind of done with us. And if we have to get our hands on them for any reason, it's like a wild banshee, man. I mean, they will eat you up and we, we have to immobilize them. Whereas chimps, even as adults, sometimes if they have a good relationship with their caregiver, you can kind of coax them into letting you do things. So I feel like the gorillas, if we can keep them alive, we can get them on a gorilla and we can get them in that group, they do really well of um, recovering and being an active member of the social group. But just like humans, both of these chimps and gorillas, all kinds of behavior. You have the very gregarious ones, you have the silly ones. One of our gorillas, they all tell me she has bedroom eyes that she gives all the guys. Um, and so they have different personalities just like people do. So you have ones that are more social than others, and so you, we probably have animals that it's harder for them to recover. Um, one little female, we have her name's um, Jingala. Um, she gave us the angry look for years. Um, and um, you know, I really felt like it was just a product of, she, she was one that was really tough and touch and go on if we were gonna get her through that early depression or not. 
In your organization, if you could ask the public for three things that we could do to help you and what you do, what would they be? So I think um, in the Western world, so many people go, well, what can I do to help a gorilla, right? So you know the economy for everything that's in those forests um, is really driven by the Western world, right? And I'm assuming everyone in here has a cell phone. Anyone not have a cell phone in here? Um, you've probably had more than one. Um, so the coltan and the tin that go into making your cell phone is mined right out of the gorilla habitat right near Grace um, and, and in all of northeastern Congo. Um, so I tell people to be a responsible consumer, right? Because we are very much a consumer society. Um, and so the wood that's where the forests are cut down, the timber in Asia and in Africa often comes to the United States, to Europe. Um, the tin, the coal tan, diamonds. I'm assuming a lot of people have saw the movie Blood Diamonds. The diamonds are uh, gold. Congo is the richest country in the world that lives in poverty. It's amazing they have all of these natural resources. So I would say be a responsible consumer um, and be an advocate um, for, for wildlife, for, for people for literacy, for education, because all of those um, help um, make um, our environment a better place. Um, so I would say do that. And then, um, you know, the unfortunate reality is, um, just like Jane in this movie, she talked about grants and she spends her time fundraising now. Um, um, you know, know that the money it takes to do these research projects and to help in these countries comes from the developed world. So, you know, find a cause that you love and um, donate often and generously, um, but, but also really help us reduce the market for the things they need to exploit in these countries. Um, and then, so I would say responsible consumer, educate yourself, promote education in others, um, and, and, and help us in funding or legislation that provides funding. Um, Grace was actually built from money from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Department. The, our first grant came from them. Um, so your tax dollars actually help build that facility. And one of the things we know, bringing jobs into the region, also brings security into that area. So um, jobs, jobs equal security over there. First of all, thank you very much. This has been tremendous. Um, I have two questions. One is kind of a follow-up about the consumer, uh, being a responsible consumer. I know a lot of the troubles in the uh, DRC, and I'm just wondering what the relationship is with the government in terms of, I know the government's very volatile there, just wondering what the relationship is with the government in trying to preserve some of that land and trying to help with the conservation efforts. And just so I don't forget, the second question is also related to zoos and what the, the, what's happening in the zoo world in terms of having chimpanzees and gorillas if they're if they're still capturing in the wild or or where you know what where they're getting what, what the zoos are doing about that. So. Okay, so I'll start with your second question because it's the easiest one. And so zoos do not import um, chimpanzees and gorillas from the wild. As a matter of fact. I believe the last chimpanzee was imported in, Joe, is it 1975? N about 1974. So, um, and probably much longer than that for a gorilla. And one of the questions I always get oh, is, oh, Disney's supporting Grace because you want those gorillas. Nope, we have plenty of our own gorillas. Um, <laughs> there's plenty of gorillas in captivity. They breed qu quite well. Um, so we, that's not why we do it. We do it because it's the right thing to do. And Grace is probably, I would say, three quarters of their funding comes from zoos. Um, so zoos have been heavily supportive of this. And if you can imagine, um, when I was first contacted about this, it's because I did, I have had the experience of working both with wild and captive animals. And they said, we need somebody who can help us figure out how to build a facility that can contain these animals and what we need to do to provide them care. So zoos provide a lot of expertise um, to these sanctuary facilities that you have to have a sanctuary because right now if a poacher has an animal 
and the, the government needs to confiscate it, their choice is to confiscate it and kill it or to let the poacher keep it, right? So they need a place to put it. And that's the role of sanctuaries in these countries. We didn't go over there and say, oh, let's build some sanctuaries. And the Jane Goodall Institute um, helped support one sanctuary in the DRC, another one in the Congo, and they used to support one in Uganda. Um, so Jean has given her help to a lot um, of these sanctuaries. But it's so we can enforce the laws. And that's where we work with the government. Um, and so we need to build the facilities. That's where the zoo site comes in. And then we um, um, work with the governments of these countries because they have to be the law enforcement arm. Okay? We have no legal standing there. right? So the government confiscates the animals. They bring them to the facility. The facility cares for them. And then as we start talking about reintroduction, again, we're working with the government to identify areas, set up protection, um, where we can put these animals back. So um, just like any government, there's great people in the government, and there's less great people um, in the government. And so it's uh, building relationships where you're working with the ones that can really help you. And um, in DRC, you know, DRC is a thousand miles wide, right? But there's not a road that connects east and west. Um, so the capital is on the west side, and we are on the east side. So we don't have a lot of influence from the national government, so we work with local governments. And we have a very good relationship with them. Did you face any challenges working with local communities in the beginning? Um, so it depends on where you are. Like I said, we were very lucky um, where we're working in the DRC because the community came to us because of previous work we had been doing. And so they approached us and they wanted to do this and asked for our help. So we have an incredible community there, but not all areas are like that. Um, and so as we're looking for potential reintroduction sites, one of the first things we do is have to go in and start working with communities. Because if the community doesn't want it there, it's not going to work, right? So um, um, it's always a matter of working with the communities and uh, making sure that they're on board. But you also have to think about how is it going to benefit the community by doing this? Because these are people that are living at the poverty level. So, you know, it's, they're incredibly altruistic, but they stop to feed their children. So, you know, what can help them? Um, and so we engage in a lot of community outreach, alternative livelihood programs, um, school programs. And again, um, our zoo colleagues help us a lot with education outreach. Um, we have like a stove program to move people from cooking on open fires to using different um, stoves that use less wood. So reduce their need to go into the forest and cut down wood, um, helping them with farming te techniques, um, all kinds of different programs like that, uh, building schools, clinics, um, and then helping them get the capacity building Congolese or whatever country you're in. Um, so it's, it's working with them. So uh, and finding the right partners, but also you have to make it beneficial for both sides. And sometimes that's the trickiest part. Someone asked me recently, what is it about um, working with humans? And we've done a lot of studies. I'm actually involved in a pretty big one now to look at this again. And I swear, I think the answer is if you're, really, if you're nice to people, they'll be nice to you. <laughs> that's kind of um, um, seems pretty... Um, elementary, but the bottom line is, um, you know, you have to work together. If you're enemies, you're, you're not going to succeed and the animals aren't going to win and the people aren't going to win. Well, the good news is gorillas don't pant hoot, so I don't have to do the pant hoot like Jane always does because gorillas just, here, I'll do my favorite gorilla face. That's good. The tight lip look, whatever they call it. Um, 
they're very they're very quiet um, but it's one of the things that's great about working with chimps and gorillas is because they're a very complex animal that that lives in a very they cover a lot of territory in the forest and they live in a lot of levels of the forest when you protect the habitat for gorillas and chimps um, you protect the habitat for all the other animals that are living there so lots of animals benefit by studying, um, by studying apes. And in Congo, everywhere there are growers, gorillas, there are chimpanzees. So the chimpanzees um, benefit by us protecting habitat for growers, gorillas. Yes? Yeah, so the question was how and when did Jane get her doctorate? Um, so doctorate programs in the United States and in the UK are different. In the United States, you do coursework and then you do, um, if, you, if you don't go into a doctorate program with a master's, you usually do a preliminary research project and then you do your full dissertation research. So it's a combination of coursework and research. In the UK, it's different. Um, you do, re it's a research degree only. Um, and then you sit for some exams, but you read books, you read papers, but you don't have to take the coursework. So what she was able to do was take all of her um, work at Gombe to use for her research degree, and then she got her degree. I'm not sure when she, she got it. Does, uh, was it Oxford, Cambridge? It was a UK degree. So a couple of my colleagues are at this table. That's why I keep staring. The people behind you, I'm not asking you. <laughs> um, um, it, it was a UK degree. It was either like, it might have been Cambridge. Um, and my guess is it probably was in the 70s. Yeah, and uh, right, and a lot of the researchers you saw in the film are still our colleagues today, um, and are running research sites in different places in the world. Some of them are still keeping Gombe going for her, and so um, the research that they were doing there um, was for their degree programs. So a lot of degrees have come out of Gombe. Yes. Hi, oh, is this on? It piqued my interest with the cell phone thing. And I've certainly cut back my purchasing of diamonds. Just teasing. Can't really purchase diamonds. Um, but are there responsible cell phones we can buy? Do you have any advice on what we should be buying? Yeah, so I was looking to see if anyone had. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I don't know. So you know there's a lot of um, legislation around um, uh, Companies have to buy minerals that can be traced. And um, there's a lot of work uh, around that, both for, for like diamonds, gemstones, as well as things that contain your computers. All of your electronics have, in, have tin in them. Okay. And so a lot of tin mining goes on in, in these areas as well. So um, it's, it's a lot of um, work is being done to be able to trace that, to make sure that it's coming from an area that where the, the workers are treated humanely, it's done ethically, and you know it, it follows a legal supply chain. So that's uh, something we could look up then as consumers. You can, and same way with wood. Um, and there's actually for wood, there's a certified green um, stamp that for different wood products you buy. But you know, I've tried asking about that and people get very confused. Um, but um, when you're going, so was this dresser made from certified wood? They're like, huh? <laughs> um, you know, came from North Carolina. Um, but so you can do that. But I, what the other thing I would say, so making sure it's responsibly sourced, um, the, the raw products. And then the second thing is, you know, do you need a new one every year? And then if you're not going to use yours, recycling it, either through a program that actually recycles the product or, you know, in Congo, we recycle things. It's called somebody else uses it or you turn it into something different. So, you know, a lot of cell phones, they use them for women's shelters and different things like that. So it may not meet your needs, 
but it meets other people's needs. So, so instead of just throwing it in your trash, which goes to, to the landfills okay. here, uh, make sure it goes to a program. But if you look on, um, Gur, does, do we have it on the GRACE website about recycling cell phones? Do we have anything about that? Okay. So, Wonderful. So, so if you look on, um, there's some cards out there at the table that will give you the GRACE website. And um, she said we've done some blogs on where you can recycle your phone um, so that it gets, the materials get used again. Great. We can all share that. So yes. thank you. Please. And, and manufacturers are now listing whether they're minerals or ethically sourced. And most of them are taking great pride in listing that on their website. So you can actually go and check Apple or Samsung and so, Joe, you have to talk into the microphone. <laughs> That's my husband. Yeah, most of the cell phone, <laughs> most of the electronics manufacturers are now listing whether or not their materials are obtained from illegal sources. And so you can just go to their website and look, and they should tell you. And so it makes it a lot easier when making a purchase. And if they don't, I would ask them, because when enough people ask, they'll do it. And just another quick note about the cell phone recycling. I work for the Jane Goodall Institute, and we also have a cell phone recycling program um, with our organization. So you can look on janegoodall.org for more information. Thank you. The website? Yeah. It's janegoodall.org. Jane Goodall. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Ms. Bettinger, so uh, let's give her another round of applause. Thank you guys so much for coming out to our Science on Screen presentation of Jane. Um, our next one will be in March, March 27th, as a part of a National Night of Science on Screen, and we're going to be showing Black Hole. Black Hole. Yeah, Black Hole. So <laughs> um, we'll see you guys then.